and I encourage you to open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, we'll, our, our message this morning will come out of verse 12, Ephesians 3, 12 and 13, and we'll read those in a minute. In our recent trip, we spent some time at several military uh, memorials and cemeteries and Civil War battles, and, and uh, there's a lot in D.C. that has to do with with uh, our national heritage and things like that. A lot of those things are very moving. As we were in Arlington, we saw two different times, we saw horse-drawn caissons, one of them with a flag-draped casket. And it's just kind of moving to, to be there and to kind of see some of this that's going on and, and, uh, and, and to see those rows of, of uh, crosses there in the, in the military graves. Have you, have you ever noticed, I'm sure you have if you've been to one, how no matter which way you look, the crosses are lined up. You know, the crosses are lined up of those who've sacrificed their lives in, in wars or at least, at least laid down their, you know, risked their lives, uh, you know, and maybe were spared, but then are now buried there uh, after, uh, after their, you know, their time of service or whatever. But it's just fascinating to see that. And, uh, and I know uh, I'm, I'm, we went to the tomb of the unknown soldier and, and just watched the changing of the guard and the respect and the honor. And uh, what, a, what a neat thing, how, it, how moving that is as you're there. And, and the, the respect and the honor that for the military that is present in our nation now, I'm grateful, and especially in comparison to the way it was uh, you know, in Vietnam and that era and that kind of a thing. I'm, I'm very grateful for that and grateful for those of you who have, who have served in the past and, and uh, those that are serving today. We're, we're grateful for those who have sacrificed or, or put their lives at risk at least in, in serving uh, and, and serving and, and giving our nation the freedoms that we enjoy. And, uh, and maybe you can tell that it moved me just being there and thinking about that. And uh, what's, what's interesting, and maybe that's partly what's in mind as I look at our passage this morning, and we're going to see both the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of Paul in verses 12 and 13. We're going to see those ideas and how the, their sacrifice ought to move us. It ought to move us to a purposeful perspective. In other words, as, I, as, as I'm at the, as the military situation there, it's a moving situation. As I, as I look at this passage and think about the sacrifice of Christ, as well as the sacrifice of Paul, it, it's, it, it ought to move us. And it ought, to, it ought to give us a perspective. And I want to encourage you in that this day to have a purposeful perspective. Now, as we look at our context... We're, we're going to see how dependent our text is on the whole chapter that we've gone over before. In fact, we're going to even go back into chapter 2 to really get a full picture of what he's doing. Because as we get to verses 12 and 13, we're kind of coming to a conclusion here. We're coming to a place where, where we're finishing up the thought that we began back in chapter 2 and verse 11. We're actually kind of concluding a whole section here that we've had in mind the idea of the idea of uh, of the Gentiles being included. And so, as we look at this passage, though, and as we peek at other verses, I want to encourage you to look at, look for Christ, because Christ is the foundation. Christ is why He is why we we have this position that we have. And the focus ought to be that Christ is the Christ is really a strong focus. Whether it be even as we talk about Paul's sacrifice, it's because of Christ. And so keep that in mind. Let's read verses 12 and 13 first of all, the Ephesians chapter three. And in verse 12 it says, "In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him." Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And notice how verse 12 starts, in whom? When we think about in whom, well, who is he talking about? You've got to back up to the previous verse. We see it, see, we see it says, uh, in Christ Jesus our Lord. But when we look at that whole verse, notice how it says, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we find 
our verse, in whom? We got to back up to verse 11. And then really, look at how verse 11 starts. According to? According to what? We got to back up to verses, verse 10. He says in verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose. Notice how that, but you know, you can't stop there. Look at how it begins. To the intent, to the intent. Where did that come from? That begs the context. Back up with me to verse 7. Of which I became a minister. You even see that we're, we're left hanging with when he says of which, doesn't he? <laughs> we're left hanging there. But notice the emphasis here. Paul says, I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. To me, who am, the le le who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship, or we said dispensation of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent, in other words, this context is just hinging each, each verse hinges on the, con the total context. And even verse 7, of which, of which what? It's the gospel in verse, in verse 6. But I'm going to go back and read from 1 to 6 with you now. Come back to verse 1. For this reason. Uh-oh. What reason? You're getting it, aren't you? It, the reason of the context that we just read in chapter 2. But we'll, go, we'll get there. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I, brief, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. See that focus of the Gentiles? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Should I shut this off? All right, we're getting too much popping here. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I was made a minister. This whole passage builds, builds, builds on the revelation that God gave the Apostle Paul. God gave him this special revelation of this mystery revelation of the dispensation of the grace of God. And, and yet, notice going back to verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, what reason? I'm going to jump clear back to verse 11 of chapter 2 because this is crucial to understanding even our context. Chapter 2 and verse 11, this is where the whole thought kind of changes. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, and that includes basically all of us, we are Gentiles, we are not Jews, we are Gentiles who, were, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. So it's the circumcised Jews who are who are thinking down and talking down about the, the uncircumcised Gentiles, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, so you were looking back in time, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, this is where the change takes place. This is what it was in the past, under law, etc. The, the Jews were God's focus. And now he says, but now the focus has shifted. The God's, God's focus has shifted. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought nigh, near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. And I'm not going to read the rest, but look at the focus. You once were far away, now you're near by the blood of Christ. It's all a focus on what Christ has done for us and what God has directed through the revelation he's given to the Apostle Paul into chapter 3. And so when we come into verse 
our verse in verse 12, we're just hinging on that whole thing. We're just connecting to that whole context of God's revelation and God's plan that Gentiles now are included in the body of Christ. You might remember this chart that we had in the past, looking at verses 12, 11 and 13 of chapter 2. Time passed, but now. We're in the but now time. We Gentiles are included. We're included in God's plan, God's design. And so as we pick up in our verse, in whom? In Christ, from verse 11. We have this, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. And this idea of in whom ought to, ought to just reach out and grab us. When we see a phrase, in Christ, or in whom, in Him, every time we see that, that ought to just, it ought to just kind of light us up. We ought to just, we, it ought to just get our attention that, that our focus, when we see this in Christ idea, it's about our position in Him. It's about our, our standing that God has established for us. That's what it's about. It's about... It's about the reality of our position in Christ, and it has nothing to do with what we do or whatever. It's what God says is true of us. And uh, I, I, sadly, as I, as I look around, even Christendom, even in Christians, and uh, even, at, even at the fair yesterday, we saw, we saw Christians very weak in their faith very weak in their understanding of spiritual things. And, and they, they, well, a lot of, oh yeah, I go to church. Oh, which one? Well, um, 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 uh, <laughs> some couldn't remember the church they went to. I'm sure they're very frequent. Uh, <laughs> and anyway, by the way, you're here at Community Bible Church, just in case anybody, <laughs> just in case anybody asks. But, but, uh, Oh, more than that, I'm consistently exposed to believers with, that struggle with life. Partly because they fail to identify with their in Christ position. There are believers that struggle all the time because they don't know and they don't dwell on, they don't, they don't think in terms of, I am in Christ. That I have an in Christ position and, and they, they just don't identify. Somehow the believer, and, it, and it's, it's probably good to keep in mind because you're going to face things in this world, but, but even believers accept the smears of someone who will, who will you know, call them unworthy or unloved or, or unwanted. None of those things are true in Christ. And as a result, people feel insecure and people feel defeated. They struggle. They doubt. I don't know what was going through this, this young man who took his life. I don't know what was going through his mind. But, it, but if we have an idea, if we have the concept from the Scripture that we have a position in Christ, and in Christ it's secure and eternal and solid, it doesn't matter what people around us say about us even, or to us. It doesn't depend on feelings and circumstances and stuff or the lack thereof. We are absolutely, irrevocably, unchangeably, eternally complete in Christ. Yeah, you know, I know you've heard me say that before, but I want it to sink in. That's what we have in Christ. That's a purposeful perspective. That's where it ought to start. That's the, that's the truth, the simple truth out of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, where he said, in him we have, notice that's the same wording we have here, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Oh, we could just gloss right over that. But in him we have, we possess, absolutely, irrevocably, unchangeably, eternally, we possess forgiveness in Him. That's ours. We need to believe it and stand on it and let it encourage our hearts. Let it give us a perspective. And over and over we see, we see truths about what we have in Christ. 
If you ever get discouraged, read Ephesians 1. Read Ephesians 1 and see what see God's love and God's grace and God's, God's forgiveness for you. Just dwell on those, those first 14 verses or so. It'll encourage your heart if you take it to if you take it to heart. Now, in our context, as we say, in whom we have, we possess, it's ours, in the same, with all those adjectives, all those vowels of assurance. In him we have, and he says we have boldness and access with confidence. Maybe you don't feel too bold today. But this is the encouragement that I think you can take home from this today. Put this in your pocket, if you will, that you have boldness and access with confidence in Christ. It's a simple, it's a simple thought that comes out of these verses, but he says it's yours. Now, to really, to really get that, we're going to look at these one at a time, but, no, but it's dependent upon the context that you keep in mind. He's writing to Gentiles who really had no God connection in the past. And now he says, you have, you have and you possess right now a boldness and a confident access to God. In the past, they floundered in their religion and idolatry. Now, they have this God connection in Christ that will carry them through. Now, a lot of times as I, well, let, let's just look at them one at a time here. Boldness. The word boldness is often tied with bold speech. And oftentimes, uh, oftentimes we talk about boldness in the sense of, yeah, they're bold in their witness or whatever. You know, I'll just kind of, based on, based on sitting there at the fair and sharing the gospel and whatever, you know, you don't have to be super bold. You don't have to be super bold to do that. Yeah, maybe it takes a little daringness to put yourself in the position. But, you know, someone invites them in or you may invite them in and you say, oh, you got to hear a story first. Oh, okay. Some, some kids are just zeroed in on getting their face painted. Okay. All right. You tell the story and you know nothing. It went in one ear and out the other or maybe it didn't even go in one ear. Okay. But amazing. Yesterday I had a kid named Nick, 11, 12-year-old. Came in with two other friends, same age. They knew, they knew that they were saved. A little wishy-washy, but Nick didn't. And, uh, and uh, Nick wanted to joke around until I made some statement. I said, you know, 11 and 12 year olds die every day. Yeah, we know that. Anyway, somehow the Lord just spoke and, and, uh, and Nick's, and I, I get to the end and uh, I just say, well, have you ever, have you ever really trusted Christ, Jesus Christ like this? And the other two, yeah, we have. And Nick said, no, but I will. I mean, just boom, you know. You know it's genuine, you know it's real. When, when the Lord's working and, and uh, here's one where it didn't go, you know, and they're gone, paint my face and let me get out of here, you know. It wasn't that. You know, we need to have, we need to have faith in Jesus Christ. I love, you know, boldness, that's what I was talking about, wasn't it? We need, to have, we need to have a boldness, but he says you have it. And when he's saying that we have boldness here, it's not so much boldness to talk. This is, this is taking this beyond that. It's taking us to a boldness that I think we should think in terms of belonging. Here these Gentiles had nothing. Chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12. And now, but now you belong. That gives us a boldness that gives us a uh, just gives, just gives us some some way to yeah I'm accepted and it, it gives us a confidence it gives us anyway the focus the focus of boldness here is just in a sense claiming your position it's claiming what God says you have in Christ and if you know that you you were outside and now you're in there's a boldness that God gives you, a confidence. And I think that's the emphasis. And then he uses the word access. By the way, boldness, access, confidence. I think, I think Paul's just trying to make one main point with these. 
I think he's trying to make one, one point, but access. The word access has the idea, comes from the word lead toward, lead and maybe lead the way. I think of the term way with this word as well, leading the way toward, you know, in Christ. In Christ, we have access. In Christ, we have a way, we have a way toward God. And it's wide open, and it's ours. You think of the Old Testament where, where the priest, once a year, once a year, he went into the Holy Holies and had access. And yes, it was important, and that's the way God designed it. But stop and think. You have access today it's yours in Christ you don't have to wait for the priest to go in and out we don't have to tie a leg on somebody to somebody that's uh, going to God for you we don't have to it's nothing like that you right now have access now this uh, I imagine some of you are thinking we have access in prayer I think this is even going beyond prayer I think it's, it's going beyond, oh, I'm going to heaven someday. It's having that position in Christ, that eternal, you're part of God's eternal purpose, verse 11. Part of God's eternal purpose that you Gentiles are now included. And again, there's that sense of belongingness, that sense of being part of the family of God. That's, that's where we are. We have this. We possess this boldness. We have this access into the big picture of God's eternal purpose. Whereas in the past, no Gentile was there. I like to think, and I, I couldn't think of a, of a super illustration probably, but I, I think of a, how about a doorknob, you know? In the past, well, I better lock it. Yeah, in the past, lock tight. Now, Access. Access granted. Access is ours. Just open the door. It's ours. Believers, every believer has that, has that access to God. And how often do we, huh? You know, we don't even tap it. We don't even think about it. We don't think that we have, we're part of God's eternal purpose. The door's wide open. The door's wide open. That's what he's saying. And confidence, I just, it, what a great word. You know, if we get the security of our position in Christ, we'll have a confidence as opposed to timidity, doubt, and uncertainty. Now, with all of these, it's not arrogance. There's no arrogance to say, oh, I got access. No, that's not the point. He just, assur it's a assuring thing. It's a certainty that we have access, access to God with confidence. It's a boldness that we are in Christ. That's where our confidence comes. And it says, when we get to the word faith, if you have a newer translation, all of the newer translations I notice say faith in him. As I look at the Greek text, I'm convinced that we should not do faith in, it should be the faith of. And I know that's harder to wrestle with. And, I, and I've consulted some experts and experts disagree here. And I'm going to fall on the side that this is the faithfulness of Christ. That's what we're talking about. The faith of Christ, his faith. In other words, this boldness and this access that we have it with confidence is not based upon how much faith you have. I think that can rob us of the, of the position that we have in Christ. This whole thing is about where we stand with Christ. It's not about whether or not I have enough faith or not. It's the faith or faithfulness of Christ rather than my faith. Compare that to verse 11 and you see, how was it accomplished? It was accomplished in Christ. That's his focus in, this, in these verses. God's eternal purpose was accomplished in Christ. And it's in him that we have this boldness and access with confidence through his faithfulness.
And so, and so as we think of this according to God's eternal purpose, Christ gave all that we might have all in him. We bumped into that statement as we toured the battlegrounds and this kind of thing. All gave some, and, but some gave all in various forms or whatever. Stop and think what Christ has done for us. He gave all that we would have all. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we have boldness and access with confidence. Now, drop down to verse 13. And Paul, Paul just reaches out to them with this personal touch, you know, his personal appeal to them. Wherefore, or therefore, well, that links us to the context. We know that. Therefore, with Christ's sacrifice and the resulting boldness in mind, with all that in mind in verse 11, and maybe with all the preceding context that we've read in mind, Paul said, don't lose heart just because I'm having a hard time. Don't lose heart because... Don't lose heart because I'm in prison. Because I'm suffering. And as we, as we think about Paul, why, why is Paul even bringing himself into the picture? Well, Paul was the one who brought them the message. I can imagine some of them even wondering about Paul's suffering. You know, that, well, man, is this true because Paul's in trouble? I mean, is this, you know... <coughs> And they're ready to kind of maybe throw everything out. But really, as, as we look at what Paul does oftentimes, he, he wears these tribulations as a badge of honor. But look at the idea of the heart. He said, don't, don't lose heart, don't faint, don't weary, don't become spiritless, don't give up. That's what he's telling them. Don't give up. If we kind of turn it around, it would be take heart. Cheer up, be enlivened. Let the Spirit of God enliven you, even in the midst of my tribulations. And when he talks about, you know, I mean, the focus is our position in Christ. He still has that in mind. And he says, talking about his tribulations, his troubles. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and you see the troubles and trials that the apostle went through. But it was all for the gospel. He wasn't a failure. He was the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Remember verse 1? He was the prisoner of Jesus Christ. And it was an honor for him to suffer for Christ. In fact, there, that could be a neat study to follow that through where Paul would, Paul would point out how that his suffering was for the gospel and for Christ. It, it, it just demonstrates the reality of the message that he has. And the bottom line is that Paul's tribulations were for their spiritual well-being. Person, persecution, prison, they're merely circumstances. <coughs> merely circumstances. And circumstances cannot change our position. Do you really believe that? Huh. When, when's the last time you've been in a pickle and then you kind of, you know, it's pretty easy to lose sight of our, our uh, position, isn't it? Pretty easy to lose sight that God has a plan and God has a purpose and God's at work in my life when things aren't maybe going so great. Pretty easy to lose sight of that. But if we look at it from God's perspective, if we look at it from our position in Christ, we won't lose heart. God has an eternal plan and purpose that's unaffected by circumstance. In fact, he says, it's for your glory. Do you, isn't that strange? He says, I'm going, through, I'm going through all this. Don't you guys lose heart that I'm going in through this struggle. Remember, it's for your glory. And again, Paul has to be going back saying, God has given me this message for you. This message where you are now included. It's the but now message from verse 13. It's the message of the dispensation of the grace of God. It's that mystery. It's that part where Gentiles and Jews are in the same body. That focus that, he, that he's been giving them all along. He said, all this is for your glory. The ultimate end, the ultimate end of all my struggles and all my sufferings are focused on your glory. And when we look at Paul's sufferings, 
Read Philippians chapter 1 and you see that life or death, neither one mattered. Life or death didn't matter because of his eternal perspective. Paul always has glory in mind. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29 and 30, he, it spans eternity. God foreknew that we would be glorified. You can refill in the blanks by reading that. You could read Romans chapter 8, 17 and 18. And Paul says that we are going to actually share. We're going to share glory. We're going to share the glory of Christ. And Philippians chapter 3 tells us that we'll experience glory like Christ's glory at his coming. Glory is part of our absolute secure position in Christ. You realize that? That's why I think Romans 8 says it's a done deal. We're going to be glorified. We're already considered that in God's, in God's mind. So because of Paul's sacrifice, we have revelation of our inclusion that leads to glory. We can be bold and confident because we have access in and as a part of God's eternal purpose. Christ provided it all through the cross, and Paul revealed it through the mystery. Christ's sacrifice brought us the means of having this purposeful connection, <clears throat> purposeful per perspective. Paul's sacrifice brought us revelation about that. And I think our privilege is to, <clears throat> is to humbly live with that kind of a perspective a purposeful perspective that we belong as part of God's eternal purpose. We fit in God's eternal purpose. So if I kind of, I thought of it in this light that what's really the question? What's really the elephant in the room? I think the question is, am I, am I as moved as I, am I as moved by Christ's sacrifice and Paul's sacrifice as I am about the military sacrifice for our nation? Am I as moved? Boldness, confident access. That's mine in Christ. If you identify with that, let it move you. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that we are now included. We are in Christ. We have a position that's eternal and unchangeable. We thank you, Father, that we can rest in that. We thank you for what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us on that cross. And we just pray that we would be so moved that we would catch that eternal perspective what's important in my life this day. For your glory, Father. Amen.